Okay, everybody. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Nathan Rutherford today to give our presentation. Um, Nathan's a graduate student at the University of New Hampshire, uh, and I believe this is his first talk to a big international audience. Uh, yes. So uh, everybody be gentle about the questions, but also don't hold up on asking good questions. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Nathan. Okay. All right. Does this appear fine for everyone? Okay, great. Awesome. So yeah, welcome everybody and welcome to uh, my talk on constraining asymmetric bosonic dark matter using neutron star mass radiation measurements. Uh, this is uh, based on the paper that I, my first paper that recently just came out uh, in August. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to basically be taking you through that paper. Okay. So first, I'm going to provide a nice introduction because I think that title is a mouthful and I think it needs some, some prefacing of, of some things. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is, well, what is asymmetric dark matter? Asymmetric dark matter is essentially a set of theories that are motivated by the observation that the mass density of dark matter is only approximately five times greater than that of visible matter. Um, and one, one quick thing of note is that uh, I will constantly be switching between uh, visible and baryonic in the early part, but I mean the same thing when I say visible and baryonic matter. Uh, just to be uh, clear on that point. Um, so this similarity in the observed densities of dark matter and baryonic matter suggests a strong connection in the cosmic history between the two. This, connect, this connection suggests that, you know, like the long-established baryon, baryonic asymmetry, at some point in the early universe, there was a tiny excess of dark matter over, uh, over the anti-dark matter particles. And the dark matter particles today constitute to the excess after all the anti-dark matter particles were annihilated. Now, this dark asymmetry allows for significant self-repulsions between the dark matter particles and small attractive interactions between the dark matter particles and the baryonic particles. And the first question you may ask is, why am I bringing this up? And I haven't, uh, like, what, what is the point of bringing up the self-repulsion? Well, the reason being is that uh, I said that we were looking at bosonic asymmetric dark matter. And in, in order to have bosonic asymmetric dark matter inside of neutron stars, uh, we need a repulsive self-interaction uh, to prevent the dark matter core from collapsing into a black hole and devouring the neutron star. So that is why I preface that here, just to give you a little bit of an idea why I think that's important. Okay, so now that I have introduced what is asymmetric dark matter, I want to talk about a specific case of uh, bosonic asymmetric dark matter, which is what we're going to look at. And so here, I just, uh, I just kind of want to introduce the conceptual uh, part of this uh, of this model. So this model uh, comes from uh, the Nelson et al. paper that you see in the corner. Uh, and essentially, what it describes is an MEV GEV mass scale particle, bosonic particle with repulsive self interactions. Now, two identical particles self interact when they scatter off one another, as you can kind of see in the image here. Uh, and they scatter off through one another by uh, exchanging something known as a gauge boson, in other words, a force carrier. This exchange causes the particles to have a momentum exchange, and that momentum exchange will attract or repel each other, uh, will cause the two identical particles to attract or repel each other. And that is what I adapted an image from uh, the internet to show the dark matter uh, repulsive self interaction through the exchange of this uh, force carrier or vector gauge boson called phi mu. Now, this, uh, as I say in the next point, that is what that is. It's an EV-MEV mass scale vector gauge boson. Now, uh, this uh, vector gauge boson also carries the stand standard baryon number. Now, the reason why uh, that's set that way is so that uh, we can create the dark matter asymmetry I had mentioned in the previous uh, slide. So now the reason why we're interested in such a model like this is because one, it's a very general model. And it's general because it considers the only necessary interactions uh, that one would need to have an asymmetric uh, bosonic dark matter model. One, you have the self repulsion needed to stabilize the core inside the neutron star. Two, uh, you have an interaction with the dark matter and the baryonic matter so that we can establish the asymmetry. And three, of course, uh, we have the interaction with gravity. That is what this model encompasses and it's very general. So it that is the main reason why we had chosen such, such a model. Okay, so now that I've briefed you on, on 
asymmetric dark matter and the model that we're going to be considering, how does that all relate to neutron stars? Well, this all relates to neutron stars because, uh, you know, uh, dark matter can accumulate in these stars. And also, we don't necessarily un uh, quite understand uh, the neutron star equation of state. And so, as you see in the top image, I have a little, a little figure who has quartered up a neutron star. They're looking at the core, and they don't really know what they see. And I think that kind of captures our uncertainties in the neutron star equation of state. So essentially, the microphysical behavior of ultra-dense neutron-rich matter is really poorly understood. And this allows for neutron stars to potentially contain exotic states of matter, such as you know, deconfined quarks or hyperons, where hyperons are essentially baryons, where one of the quarks, at least one of the quarks, is a stretch quark. Now, the effects of these hypothetical components in neutron star interiors are, ca are effectively captured by the equation state, which has traditionally uh, been understood to have only a baryonic component. So uh, how can we study the equation state? The equation state can be studied through measurable properties because it can be deduced uh, through the mass and radius. As we see in the bottom, uh, bottom image here, I, I just selected uh, you know, several baryonic uh, equation of state and showed some of the nice resources of J0437, J0030, and 0740, where uh, 0030 and 0740, I've shown their 68% confidence intervals. Um, and as we can see, there's a lot of different equation of state that seems to satisfy uh, the constraints set by those sources. So it, I just wanted to show this such that, um, just to emphasize the point that the uncertainty is, is very much still around. Okay, so, you know, now that you know we we have this uncertainty, it turns out dark matter too can uh, have a significant impact on the mass and radius of neutron stars, and uh, it can have an impact. But the question is, well, uh, you know, how can dark matter get in or around these stars if it has an impact? Uh, so one possible theory is neutron bremsstrahlung of ADM, which was proposed by Nelson et al. and uh, neutron conversion to ADM. This is a combination of the two. Uh, so uh, you can combine them because they're, they're both allowed, I believe. Uh, so neutron bremsstrahlung effectively converts kinetic energy of two neutrons scattering off one another uh, to the dark mediator uh, or force carrier phi mu. And because phi mu mediates the repulsive self-interactions between dark matter particles, the rate of two neutrons scattering and producing a dark matter anti dark matter pair uh, will also proceed at a comparable rate. If that uh, conversation may, uh, or that, that talk may be a little confusing, I, I wanted to show a little image of what it looks like in the standard model. So if you have a, an electron quickly approaching a proton, it can eject a photon and lose energy as it uh, goes around the photon, uh, the proton. And so this photon uh, would be able to, you know, is what carries off. And that's the same sort of mediator here, uh, the same sort of idea that is going on with neutron from Um Now, uh, the second one is where uh, neutrons can convert to ADM. Now, this is just a direct conversion, uh, you know, not necessarily talking about all the, you know, finalities that come from the particle physics that allows this to happen, but essentially this can occur uh, in neutrons and compact objects because the neutrons can have a Fermi momenta that exceeds the minimum to allow this reaction to become frequent. This frequent, uh, this frequent, this reaction happens in more or less younger stars because you have, you know, higher average kinetic energies in the star, which allows for this conversion to be more frequent. Now, both of these processes combined can produce dark matter admixed neutron stars with around 7% uh, of the mass of the neutron star being dark matter. And this would effectively endow uh, most neutron stars with similar amounts of dark matter because this is dependent on uh, you know, neutrons scattering off each other. Uh, the mass can impact it, but not uh, a lot, uh, according to, to Nelson et al. Now, if we wanna achieve higher fractions, we need to look to other methods of accumulation, such as the absorption of a dark matter star by baryonic matter as proposed by Karkavandi et al., uh, as well as uh, a neutron star passing through a dark matter overdensity uh, in the galaxy and allowing it to accumulate, you know, something more than, you know, the, the proposed 7%.
Okay, so now we understand, you know, how dark matter can get in neutron stars. Where, where can it accumulate and what are its effects on the neutron star? So dark matter can accumulate in two spatial regimes. The first, in, in the interior of the neutron star, this is known as a dark matter core. Now the effect of this is it effectively reduces the gravitational mass and the radius uh, and tidal deformability, which we don't show the tidal deformability. So here I show a simple mass radius diagram where the solid line is the baryonic neutron star and the blue dash dotted line here is the same exact uh, neutron star, but now we have considered a dark matter component. And as we see, we, have, we see a reduction in the gravitational mass and the radius. The other spatial regime is where we have a halo, which effectively uh, is where the dark matter distribution extends through and beyond the baryonic surface. And now this has an added effect of increasing the gravitational mass on the neutron star, as well as the tidal deformability not shown. Uh, and so we're, again, the dash, the blue dash dotted line is the dark matter admic neutron star, and this uh, orange solid line is just the baryonic neutron star. And uh, to address the possible future question here, of you know why is it that we don't see the radius increase? Uh, that's because we uh, you know when one measure uh, would go to measure you know say uh, a hypothetical neutron star with a halo, we wouldn't necessarily be able to determine the uh, the boundary of where the halo is because dark matter does not interact with with photons, so it's effectively invisible. However, what we would measure potentially is the actual total gravitational mass of the system from the outgoing photons from the baryonic surface because the halo would modify those trajectories and potentially would give us uh, a higher mass than what the actual neutron star is. So, you know, searching for the observable effects of dark matter on neutron star interiors requires measurements of the mass and radius, of course. And the state-of-the-art method to measure this is pulse profile modeling. Uh, so, uh, for those that don't know, uh, PPM exploits the relativistic effects of X-rays emitted from the hot magnetic portal caps of millisecond pulsars. And, and it also involves a Bayesian inference of a pulse profile for a generative relativistic ray tracing model of the thermal emission of those hot spots on the neutron star surface. And then this analysis through you know, a Bayesian inference and a likelihood calculation can give you posterior probabilities of a neutron star's mass and radius. And what I show here in the image is a summary from, uh, from Anna Watts's uh, paper in 2019. Uh, I borrowed it from her. Uh, and it basically effectively summarizes what PPM is about. It takes in you know, the pulse profile, a light curve model, and instrument properties, chucks it into a Bayesian inference code, does some calculations, gets the mass radius. And from the mass radius, we can get constraints from the equation state. Now, mass radius measurements techniques, you know, have been advanced by the NICER team, which uses PPM. And to date, you know, NICER has inferences for two neutron stars, uh, PSR J0030 and PSR J0740. Now, how, why did I bring a PPM? Well, PPM and ADM, uh, uh, ADM can influence PPM and, and alter how it's conducted. So, you know, although uh, NICER and future missions such as Strobex and EXTP uh, will perform pulse profile modeling on compact objects. Current pulse profile modeling techniques do not account for the possibility of a dark matter component. And this has uh, can have a profound effect on how it's done, in which uh, I'll show a few examples. So dark matter in or around the neutron star will modify the ray tracing models currently being used by NICER, uh, and which will uh, you know, effectively alter how pulse profile modeling is executed. A nice, uh, some nice simple examples here is the existence of the halo will modify the exterior space time of the neutron star. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, will alter the uh, photons trajectories um, that we measure from the baryonic surface. And this could lead us to have uh, incorrect results uh, if we don't account for, for, for dark matter. The second example is that dark matter uh, could modify the universal relations for the LIDON to model the oblateness of the neutron star, uh, as proposed by you know, several papers, uh, one of them from uh, 
from Sharon Mortzig. Uh, and this factor can also affect the exterior space time of the neutron star. So now that I've you know, introduced ADM, I've talked about what model we're doing and you know, how neutron stars and ADM relate and how we're going to measure it, let's talk about the plan for our study. All right. So the first thing I want to point out is we're going to restrict ourselves to dark matter cores and least halos for future work because the existence of a halo will effectively alter uh, how PPM is conducted. And we're currently having uh, good discussions uh, with Sharon Morsick and Anna Watts uh, and, and, and others about how we're going to actually do this and, and implement this in a, you know, a potential, uh, you know, study. Um, so just for that point, uh, and so now what we do is we're going to perform a Bayesian parameter estimation of bosonic asymmetric dark matter, which varies the baryonic matter equation state uh, and fix the baryonic matter equation state. Now, we, we vary the baryonic matter equation state because it's the most conservative approach to a Bayesian analysis of neutron stars. Therefore, you know, the most likely equation state, and by extension, the mass radius relation of baryonic matter and a ADM can be inferred. Um, we study the fixed baryonic equation of state case, uh, although you know, it's hard to envision a scenario where we would, it could constrain the baryonic matter equation state independent of ADM, uh, since you know ADM can also impact uh, gravitational wave events, um, but you know this case might be interesting uh, to those developing theoretical models, uh, and so uh, or you know it also may be useful for those uh, looking at developing baryonic equation states from heavy ion collisions. Now um, we also uh, based on the previous slide because ADM can alter the oblateness. Uh, relations uh, for neutron stars, we decided to use synthetic uh, mass radius measurements from simulated neutron stars uh, because, you know, the mass radius measurements could be altered in the presence of dark matter model. All right. So, and in this Bayesian parameter estimation, we are going to consider two scenarios. The future scenario that I, that we deemed uh, is, called, is modeled after a potential end of mission nicer scenario and considers six simulated sources. And the second one is Future X, cleverly named, uh, is modeled after using six possible uh, Strobeck sources. Okay. So, and with this plan, what is our objective? We want to demonstrate uh, the ability of using Bayesian inferences uh, to constrain the properties of bosonic asymmetric dark matter. That is, the possible particle mass, the mass fraction of the total accumulated ADM, inside the neutron star and the self repulsion strength. And secondly, we also want to characterize the effects of the derived uncertainties of the baryonic matter equation state when including ADM cores and neutron stars. All right, with a side goal of also showing that future X has an ability to provide tighter constraints in future, the future scenario. All right, so now let's set the stage for our approach. So, Typically, neutron stars are modeled using a single fluid, uh, namely the baryonic matter equation state, and one solves the classic, you know, Tolman oppenheimer volkoff or TOV equations for the pressure, mass, and radius, you know, given some central density. However, to study uh, dark matter admixed neutron stars, we need something called the two fluid Tolman oppenheimer volkoff equations. Uh, this is necess you know, necessary to study the uh, admixed neutron stars where the dominant interfluid interaction is gravitational. So um, this allows us to uh, write down the two fluid formalism. Because uh, the two uh, fluids only interact gravitationally, they satisfy their own conservation of energy momentum equation, and which allows us to split the pressures and the energy densities as two separate uh, thing, uh, entities. And in doing that, if you take the TOV equations and you apply that uh, formalism, you wind up with the two fluid TOV equations, which shows us that um, we can uh, calculate the, flu uh, the fluid pressures, mass, and radii of the baryonic part separately. And we can also calculate the fluid pressure of ADM, uh, its mass, and the radii as well. All right. So in order to solve the TOV equations, we need the uh, equations of state. So uh, the Nelson et al. model yields this following uh, 
ADM equation state for that specific model, uh, where uh, the first the first term uh, is essentially uh, just a mass term, and the second term uh, encapsulates the repulsive self interactions between the particles. So m chi here is the ADM particle mass. m chi is its number density, and g chi over m phi is the effective self repulsive strength. That's how we measure it. So this gives us two defining parameters for the ADM EOS. However, there's another one. This is the mass fraction that I was talking about. Um, so this mass fraction basically is just a fraction of the total gravitational dark matter mass over the total gravitational mass of that neutron star, where uh, m chi of r chi is the total gravitational mass of ADM evaluated, excuse me, at the ADM core radius. And MB uh, of RB is the total gravi gravitational mass of the baryonic matter. So effectively, now we have three defining parameters for the equation state. We have the repulsive self-interaction strength, particle mass, and mass fraction. All right. So now we have one equation state satisfied. The next one, this is the baryonic matter equation state, which we have used from uh, my collaborator, uh, Herrick Reimachers in several of his works, which is a model of three polytropes divided by, uh, you know, varying transition densities. So that gives us five parameters. However, uh, this model is a little bit more sophisticated in that the neutrons have, uh, because neutron stars have central densities above nuclear saturation density, which causes the uncertainties uh, in the equation state. And just for clarity, the nuclear saturation density is really just the fixed number for the nuclear number density, which is roughly uh, 0.6 uh, over, uh, nucleons per femtometer cubed. Now, these uncertainties can be captured in a special uh, sort of framework known as chiral effective field theory. And chiral effective field theory is just a model independent framework to study baryonic matter uh, in, the, in its most simplest terms. Um, so uh, the way this model is constructed is that we employ uh, a polytropic fit to those uh, chiral effective field theory calculations between half the saturation density and a little bit above it. Um, and now below it, what we do is we collect, uh, we connect it to a crust equation state for the neutron star, in particular, uh, the BPS crust equation state. And above those densities, we connect back to our uh, polytropic uh, parameterization. And on the right here, I show a plot uh, of the equation state in the um, energy density pressure plane, where the red line represents the crushed equation state and the black line represents the core equation state. Okay, so now that we have our equations of state uh, and uh, the two, two fluid TUV equations, we can now discuss our inference framework to show how we incorporate ADM into the inference method. All right, so this is going to be the most math heavy part of the talk. And so please bear with me as we go through this. So uh, following the framework outlined uh, in the same works and where we got the uh, polytropic model from Herr uh, we use we use Bayes' theorem. Uh, and on the right, I show it there in case uh, anyone is not familiar with it. But Bayes' theorem effectively is a way of showing uh, relating conditional probability statements uh, to write. Uh, so we use Bayes' theorem to write the posterior distribution here. Uh, on the right, where theta is a vector containing all equation state parameters, that is baryonic and ADM equation state parameters. Epsilon sub C is a vector containing the baryonic and the ADM central energy densities. And D is the mass, radi mass radius data that we're going to use. Uh, so using Bayes' theorem, we can create the second line of the proportionalities, uh, and then we relate uh, the likelihood function here of uh, P of D vertical data epsilon C uh, and rewrite them as functions of gravitational mass and the radius here. Now, making um, a nice, uh, I guess, simplification and assumption here, uh, we can equate the likelihood function, which is this last line here, uh, that last probability here, uh, to the PPM derived mass radius posteriors and assume each of these posteriors is independent, which is going to result in this ad, uh, additional proportionality statement where now we can multiply each 
of the likelihood functions together. And where I is going to run over all the, the number of stars that we consider. So in this case, we have six. However, now if we want to change this up with some with ADM, um, we sample over the ADM mass fraction. So we introduce a new vector and we're able to rewrite uh, our previous proportionalities. And this is what's going to define our inference framework. Now, the reason why we sample over the mass fraction is because our mass radius algorithm is structured such that the dark matter energy density is dependent on the mass fraction. Okay. Oh, and lastly, sorry, I didn't mean to forget this. Uh, epsilon C sub B is the baryonic central energy density and epsilon C sub chi is the ADM central energy density. All right, so now that we've gone over the uh, inference framework, let's discuss some of the source selections that we need for our uh, for our scenarios here. So for the future scenario, I'll start on the left and move to the right. Uh, we use three of the six sources uh, that are assumed to have an a priori known mass corresponding to three nicer targets, J0740, J1614, and J0437. And for each of these known sources, we, we assume a 5% uncertainty in the radius. And the remaining three sources uh, are chosen between 1.2 and 2.1 uh, solar masses and have a 10% uncertainty in their mass and radius because they're not measured yet. And I show their sources here on the left, where the blue represents uh, a ground truth model that I'll describe in the next bit. And on the right here, uh, we have uh, another ground truth model, uh, which is the baryonic source. So on the right, the future, future X scenario, there, we have six sources again. Uh, chosen between 1.2 and 2.2 solar masses, but this time we give them a lower uncertainty because Strobex is, is expected to be able to deliver lower uncertainties uh, around the 2% level with longer exposure times, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's what I had just mentioned. Now, interestingly enough, um, I believe uh, Tom Racone had mentioned this to, to Anna Watts in one of the discussions that... Uh, uh, this, what we see here in the future X scenario is the separation in the, uh, in the two mass radius uh, curves could suggest that if two neutron stars with the same mass but different radii were measured at a 2% uncertainty, uh, one could conclude that one of those, new, one could possibly conclude uh, that one of those stars could have ADM while the other might not. It's a possible scenario that, that could come of this. Uh, and I, I thought that was a really cool thing. And we also mentioned that in our paper, uh, which is, a, uh, I, I thought, cool conclusion that came from that that I didn't notice initially. Um, okay, so now that we have our sources, we have our inference framework, let's talk about these ground truth models where we're calculating these mass and radii of these synthetic sources. So there's two that we consider. One of them is we deem the ADM core model, which is described by the piecewise polytropic model that I of the baryonic part as before. They have the same baryonic part, but they have uh, this one has an ADM core, which is defined by these three key parameters, um, where you know we have a 15 GeV mass uh, particle mass, uh, a 0 0.1 self-repulsion strength. That's just a, a number. Uh, I can explain what those mean in a moment. And then 7% mass of dark matter. And the second one is the no ADM model. This is where we have set the mass fraction to zero. Now, just for clarity's purposes, uh, this, this uh, ground truth model uh, does not mean that we're not sampling over the dark matter parameter space. Dark matter is still being considered in this ground truth. It is just another ground truth model that we are uh, looking into and seeing if our results change if we change up the ground truth model. And so this is what I had showed on the previous slide, but I showed again for extra clarity purposes, um, where the blue line is the ADM core model mass radius curve. And the orange dash dotted line is the no ADM model, which we see here. And then I show the um, mass posteriors of 0740 and the three sources used for the future case. All right. So we need priors to, to establish our inference method. So the first prior that we need here are the priors on the ADM particle mass. So in order to get the priors here, one of the physical constraints that came out here was uh, presented by Kuvaris et al. in 2013, uh, 2011, which 
showed that you know if we want to avoid adium particles from escaping the neutron star, we need to have masses greater than uh, 10 to the minus 2 mega electron volts. Uh, on the opposite end here, uh, if one increases the mass, you have to start worrying about black hole formation in neutron stars, which is uh, talked about by Bramante et al. in 2013, uh, which showed that uh, in order to avoid bosonic core collapse, uh, you have to set the upper bound between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 7 GeV, depending on the self-repulsion strength of the ADM particles. So we take the lower bound on this so that we don't have to, uh, since uh, the self-repulsion strength moves up, as you crank up the self-repulsion strength, you can allow higher and higher uh, ADM particle masses. So in order to uh, avoid some confusion here, we, we adopt a lower bound here. So as we uh, turn up the self-repulsion strength, we don't have to worry about uh, whether we are forming a black hole or not. Okay, so now the next parameter we're going to set the prior for is the self-repulsion strength. Uh, so the self-repulsion strength hasn't uh, been constrained yet. So to, to ensure that the self-repulsion strength has a finite prior space, we adopt a range uh, that was covered in Nelson et al. in 2018, which it, uh, gives us the range between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the 3. Uh, for the mass fraction prior, uh, there, there has already been a constraint set on uh, by uh, Karkovandi et al., uh, which set it at 5%. However, they had used a singular baryonic equation of state, uh, which had a maximum mass that just over two solar masses. And they had found this constraint based on the two solar mass constraint for mass radii, uh, which set that to be 5%. And so since we are going to be varying the baryonic equation of state, and we can find more stiff uh, mass radii from those baryonic uh, equations of state, uh, we have to shift that bound. And to account for that, we adopt uh, an upper bound on the mass fraction to be 20%. Okay, so here, I just quickly summarize here uh, the prior spaces. So uh, I, I set them as intervals, and within these intervals, we sample uniformly, however, uh, we eliminate any halo configurations after the sampling has been done. So what you see here in the two plots are the prior uh, corner plots here. Uh, so in the left, you see the future, and on the right, you see the future X scenario, where the shaded out region here represents the, and this, this arrow should have gone back uh, into that plot there, but it, I didn't catch that, I guess. Um, so the those white shaded regions are the halo configurations that we cut out. And so we gave them zero likelihood or, or probability density. Um, so we, we cut them out, and so they're there. And then what we see here and the rest of them is when you have two variables plotted uh, that are different from each other, you get a two-dimensional prior density plot. And then when you have a variable plotted against itself, you get a one-dimensional prior, prior plot. And on the diagonals, um, this effectively shows the 0 0.16, the 0 0.5, and the 0.84 quantiles, as you can see on the diagonals, even though they're kind of small, but they're not necessarily important for the prior space here. Okay, so now we have the ADM priors established. Let's get to the results when we get to the actual, actual good stuff. So a best case future X scenario when we vary the baryonic equation is state. This is a lot to take in. Um, so I'm going to take this slowly. <laughs> um, so on the left and on the right, we have future X, and then the top rows represent our posterior uh, results for the ADM parameter space for the ADM core model, and on the bottom represent the posterior results with the no ADM model. Um, so what we see here in the orange are the ground truths. In the blue dashed, we have the prior evaluations in the one-dimensional uh, posteriors, and then on the solid black lines, those are the posteriors. Um, okay, so one of the key things that we notice here is that in the uh, ratio, in the plot of the log of the uh, GKI over M phi versus uh, the particle mass, we can see that that ratio is confined to a stripe. Uh, and so effectively, we characterize this by saying that the, the high particle mass, which we characterize by masses greater than 10 to the 6 MeV, and low self-repulsion strength, which 
we characterize as uh, should be less than 0 0.1. Sorry, that should be less than. Uh, is, defa is disfavored for both scenarios. So I just wanted to highlight that stripe there. Um, and what we see is that there is a, a white triangle that has been uh, eliminated. Uh, and that white triangle corresponds to where the ADM central energy density needs to be uh, much larger than the baryonic central energy density. So to give you a brief example uh, of what this actually means uh, is, you know, for example, if you were to have, um, you know, uh, a particle mass within that triangle with a self-interaction strength in that triangle, um, in order to have a mass fraction of 0.05%, uh, the ADM central energy density needs to be a factor of 10 to the 8 times larger than the baryonic central energy density. And what this means for the mass of a neutron star is that, for example, a 2.3 solar mass neutron star could have its mass reduced to 0.12 solar masses, uh, which effectively makes that configuration disfavored based on the theoretically and observationally motivated uh, mass constraint that the produced neutron stars must have at least one solar mass. Uh, and this in, uh, constraint is in, uh, motivated by the description of uh, early neutron star evolution. Okay. So we see that the, frat, uh, the ratio of the self-repulsion in the ADM particle uh, mass is constrained to this stripe. However, individually, based on the one-dimensional posteriors, we see that they are uh, unconstrained in the remaining parameter space. Therefore, uh, we can conclude that those, part of, uh, those quantities alone cannot be constrained by neither future or future x. However, interestingly, if we go and look at the mass fraction, we see that uh, the mass fraction is the only well-constrained parameter uh, in this scenario in the one-dimensional posteriors. And what we can derive from this is that the low uh, mass fraction is favored with the highest posterior densities evaluations covering a range from 0 to 4%. And this is, this is true in all of our cases that we see here. So in, in both of our ground truth models and in our um, future and future X scenarios. So uh, next, we uh, will transform our results into the pressure and energy density plane. Uh, this has the advantage of highlighting constraints on the ADM and baryonic equation states that uh, aren't readily available in the posterior corner plots. So what I show here is our, 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 our similar plots of what you just saw, but in that uh, pressure and energy density plane. However, we add in some different terminology uh, where neglecting ADM means that the posteriors only vary the baryonic equation of state, and including ADM means that posteriors uh, that additionally vary the ADM bar uh, the ADM equation of state. And so what these lines are that we see here, uh, I added some bubbles just for clarity. We have the 95% confidence region uh, in the dashed orange line. The black uh, dashed line is the 95% combined prior. Uh, and then here we have uh, the lighter region, the lighter green region being 95% the 95% confidence region where the darker one is 68% confidence. So as we see in both of these scenarios, uh, the including ADM band is noticeably wider than the 95% uh, confidence interval than neglecting ADM band. Uh, what this tells us is that uh, a stiffer baryonic equation state implies that the posterior constraints from all current and future nicer and uh, nicer sources and the future sources of Strobex can be relaxed if ADM is considered uh, in the equation state analysis. Um, also, uh, these plots demonstrate that future X can more tightly constrain uh, the neutron star equation state due to the higher confident, uh, tighter confidence bands in both posteriors. To give you, uh, you know, some, some quick examples here, uh, I calculated uh, how much wider uh, each uh, each band was then the each including ADM band was wider than the 95% uh, confidence of the neglecting ADM band. So for the future scenario, we found that at 14.71 uh, uh, energy density, log energy density, uh, it's roughly 20.67 and 
and 27.66% wider for the ADM core and no ADM models, respectively. But for the future X scenario, we provide tighter constraints at 7.48% and 28, uh, and then we got wider uh, at the 28.16% for the ADM core and no ADM core models. All right. So now we can move on to the fixed baryonic equation of state. Uh, here, um, Fixing the baryonic equation state reduces the number of parameters sampled over. So instead of having what we had as 10 in the varying baryonic equation state, we eliminated all baryonic equation state parameters from our Bayesian inference. And now we just have the three dark matter parameters. Uh, and what we see uh, most clearly is that the, the dark matter uh, mass fraction posteriors became more Gaussian like in shape. Um, and that Gaussian like uh, then there are, uh, of course, uh, varying baryonic EOS uh, counterparts. That Gaussian-like shape uh, shows, basically can tell us that if the baryonic equation state is better understood than it is now, uh, then tighter constraints on the mass fraction can be imposed. Um, so just to give you uh, another example where FutureX is able to more tightly constrain the dark matter mass fraction here, uh, the four sigma de uh, deviations for the ADM core and no ADM core models is at uh, plus or minus 9% mass fraction and plus, plus or minus 7% uh, for both models, respectively. And for the future scenario, we now have uh, wider percentages at 13% and 15% for the ADM core and no ADM models, respectively. And that is what the fixed baryonic equation of state case gave us. So now to wrap all that up, because I know that was a lot, um, what we did, we performed a Bayesian inference of the dark matter particles, mass, the self-repulsion strength, and the mass fraction, which you know, with using synthetic mass radius posteriors. Now, what we learned from the uh, cases where we varied the baryonic equation of state, essentially, Regardless of the baryonic equation state, the future and future X scenarios will be able to constrain the ratio of uh, the particle mass and self-repulsion strength and the most likely uh, bosonic ADM mass fractions. Also, uh, what we found in the energy density uh, pressure plane, the statistical uncertainty of the neutron star inference is widened when the possibility of the ADM core is considered. Next. Um, what we found here um, is in the fixed baryonic equation of state, we can more tightly constrain the mass fraction, but no new results can actually be found from that. Uh, we have also shown uh, the value in performing a full inference on the bosonic ADM parameter space, rather than drawing con conclusions from uh, each parameter individually, uh, because the generosities between those parameters can confound uh, the effects of the ADM parameters, which would make it difficult to draw meaningful conclusions uh, on any one of the parameters if an inference was not done. Although our inference does indeed show a degeneracy, uh, it also displays an ability to provide constraints on ADM parameters, which may not otherwise be found. In particular, the, um, uh, the ratio of the self-repulsion strength with the dark matter particle mass. And finally, uh, we have uh, this work essentially demonstrates that the, the future ability of NASA missions such as NICER and Strobex to constrain the ratio of the dark matter particle mass and mass fraction, but not the individual quantities of the particle mass and self-repulsion strength in the Nelson et al. model. Now, in this work, uh, we didn't do everything exactly, but we do have some future work planned. Uh, so uh, future work will include, you know, gravitational wave constraints, and uh, we'll do that by including the tidal deformability calculations, uh, which consider a dark matter component. Uh, we'll also uh, account for ADM halos by appropriately modifying the ray tracing models uh, used by the NICER collaboration and how PPM is conducted. Uh, and also uh, in our scatter, in, in the scatter of our sources, we didn't include uh, we didn't include any of that. Um, and the reason being is that that in, uh, introduces an added arbitrariness uh, into the sources and the uh, this can make things uh, more convoluted for us. So we just considered a, a simplest case here. Um, so we will include scatter uh, around the data 
uh, around those ground shoots. And then uh, the combination of the inferences with the scatter and the halos uh, can allow for, for general and accurate statements about the constraints in the ADM parameter space. And without further ado, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Nathan. I thought that was a really great uh, presentation of a very complicated topic. Um, 